Welcome to the John Gets Games Questions and Answers Vlog. Now, this was recorded live on December 8th, 2020, and I then went through and edited it down to the questions that I thought were most relevant overall. Now, I would like to mention that if you'd prefer to listen to this instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the John Gets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos just like this, one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with nice bonuses like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's now jump into the questions. Pennywise says, how do you manage to learn each game so well to be able to teach it and play it seamlessly? I love your tutorial videos. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoy those. Um, the short answer is uh, probably the proximity of time between reading the rules and filming the video. Uh, I very often read the rules and then turn the camera on and just start recording the video. So I just read the rules and the rule book is right there uh, just off camera. So uh, I can easily reference it. Um, you know, I edit out a ton of dead air uh, in my, my tutorial videos where, you know, I'm about to say something, but I go and I double check it because I've made enough mistakes and had to refilm enough videos that I try to be very diligent to essentially walk through entire sections of the rulebook when I teach something new. Like if it's a game with attacking, for example, um, before I do the first attack, I will reread that section. It's right next to me. And then I'll even go point by point to make sure that I am uh, hopefully not missing anything. Um, and beyond that, I mean, I like to think I have just, I don't know, maybe a built up skill for it, considering I've read thousands of board games <laughs> and I've made hundreds of videos, uh, you know, especially ones that teach. So I guess uh, practice makes perfect. Hopefully I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but, um, but yeah, it, realistically, the, the biggest thing is that the rule book's right next to me and I'm constantly reading it while I'm actually recording. Uh, Johannes Nelson asks, uh, as you are working on the rulebook for Darwin's Journey, will there be a playthrough tutorial coming up? Your playthroughs are uncontested. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, actually, that's kind of how this started. Uh, I've done a couple of sponsored videos for Thundergriff over the past couple years, um, and I actually heard about Darwin's Journey, reached out to them and said, hey, would you be interested in a sponsored video for this? And they said, yes. Also, would you be interested in helping us write the rulebook? It's a little bit more complicated than that, but yeah, so uh, I will be doing uh, my standard tutorial style video for that one. I don't have a copy of it yet. I've just been working on a rather high quality tabletop simulator mod that they've been using for development. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a tutorial coming out for that one. Matt asks, as a new fan in the genre, I'm exploring older games. Are you only addressing newer games? So yeah, I, I guess in, in general, do I only talk about newer games is I think the question there. Um, and, and for the most part, yes, uh, because you know the vast majority of my content is sponsored because that is how I make my living. And in general, people pay to have marketing campaigns for uh, newer games. Uh, occasionally, older games will uh, win uh, various polls from Patreon backers. Although if I'm being honest, the polls that I put up for most of the Patreon backers, those generally have the newest games that I acquired, not necessarily the, the newest published games. Sometimes I'll get an older game and I'll put it up in the poll as well. Uh, so sometimes something will sneak on through. Uh, but you know, over the years, uh, well, I did um, uh, Terraforming Mars just a few months ago and that one's several years old, uh, as well as A Feast for Odin that happened about a year and a half ago. So older games do trickle in, but it is kind of a, a reality of the board game media sphere that in general, people are most interested in the new stuff. And so that does get the most coverage uh, and I am included in that. Bill says, uh, question, do you play any games solo? Which ones do you like? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Uh, I've tried to play solo games in the past and they just don't click for me for some reason. I think maybe I have played too many games against myself for tutorials and playthroughs, you know, hundreds of games like that, that even when I'm playing alone, I feel like I should be playing against myself to a certain extent. And whenever I've tried to play a game that had some sort of uh, dummy player or Automa or something like that, or even just trying to get a high score, I just don't care enough. It's funny. It's just a mental block for me. I just find myself usually getting like a third of the way through the game. And I'm like, I just rather do something else. Like uh, for me, the magic of board games involves another human being, at least one other human being. Uh, so unfortunately for me, that means if it's just me, in general, the magic is gone. Um, fortunately for the playthroughs and the tutorials, I would say there's a bit of magic there uh, because I'm making the, the instruction, instructive type content and I figured out how to make that work. But yeah, I, I, I keep trying solo games, you know, every few months when I get a new game and I really want to try it um, that night and I read the rules and then I try the solo mode and I'm just like, eh, I'll just wait till I can play it with other people. Uh, I know a lot of people love it and that's great. It just, it's not something that's for me. Calix asks, hey, John, I noticed some of the games have playthroughs and tutorials for are not rated on BGG. I used to watch you mainly for your excellent pro and con 
uh, video reviews. Yeah, well, the main reason for that is because I actually don't play most of the games I cover with tutorials. Um, many, I, I think well over 50% of the tutorials that I make, or at least the sponsored ones, um, are with prototypes. And I just read the rules and I, I film the video and then I pack it up and then I send it on to the next person on the publisher's uh, reviewer list. Uh, and I don't really count those as official plays, especially these days when I'm not actually playing through the entire game. But even before, when I played through the whole game, I cheated rampantly in those tutorials and playthroughs. You know, I, I was trying to get exciting, interesting moments. I would try to stack the deck to have uh, an interesting variety of cards and that kind of stuff show up in every video because I want the game to show its best self, essentially. And so I don't really feel like I can, I can rate a game off of that. Um, and yeah, I, I <laughs> honestly, I miss the fact that my pro-con uh, uh, reviews aren't out there anymore. I just... I wish somebody else was making that exact type of video and I didn't have to actually make them because the problem wasn't the video itself. The problem was that I seriously disliked actually making those videos. Um, so maybe someday uh, I'll come back to it, but I think it's pretty unlikely, unfortunately. Fred asks, when you get your games in the mail, are you worried about COVID being on the game from the person playing before you? What precautions do you take? That's an interesting question. We definitely, um, you know, as a family, uh, talked about this early on in the pandemic. And there's, you know, a bunch of research um, about this. And uh, everything seems to say that picking up a box in the mail, like the, the, the risk is super low. You know, we try to wash our hands every time we get new packages in and every time we come in from the grocery store or something like that. Um, but in general, the biggest risk is the virus being airborne and, you know, it, you breathing it right in as opposed to being a, a small amount of it on a package. So we do try to take precautions um, as much as we can, but it's true. We do get a lot of boxes <laughs> that come into this house. Ming asks, do I have any thoughts on Eclipse Second Dawn? And the answer is yes, I have a lot of thoughts about Eclipse Second Dawn. Uh, I'm not going to go into it right now, but um, I loved the original Eclipse. I played it, I think, 13 or so times over the course of a couple of years. Uh, I haven't played it in seven years, but then I watched the Shut Up and Sit Down uh, uh, review video for it that was out like a week and a half ago, and it just reignited my thrill for the game, and I loved everything that I was seeing as far as the tweaks and changes for the second edition versus the first edition. It particular, I was one of those people who hated the plasma missiles in the first edition, and I think that hopefully they've been balanced out in the second edition. So I bought a copy. I spent a lot of money buying a copy of it, and I actually just two days ago or three days ago played a two-player game of it with a good friend of mine on Tabletop Simulator. So I haven't played my physical copy, which I have received, and it's gorgeous, honestly. It's got all these great trays, and it fits in this big box. I'm so happy to have it. Honestly, I, I got it. I opened the box up, and I spent four hours meticulously punching everything out, sorting everything, reading every part of the rule book and reading every uh, race board. And I just kind of just swam around in everything that was that massive box of Eclipse Second Edition, uh, enjoying everything about those like four hours that night. And then I played it with a friend online and I really enjoyed it. Obviously, I didn't need to buy it to play it on Tabletop Simulator, but I had bought it already and I'm quite happy that I enjoyed it and we are uh, looking to play some more games of this. I think Eclipse is great and I am planning on talking about it in an impressions vlog I might do one just off of this two-player game, or I might wait to get another player, uh, another game of it in, maybe with more players. I'm not sure, but uh, so far, I, it looks like I still love Eclipse. <laughs> Bill asks, who is my favorite game designer? Um, well, I don't have a singular designer that's definitely my favorite overall. Uh, I definitely have some designers that I like um, in general that I, I pay more attention to their designs. Um, Let's see, Andreas Stedding is one that definitely sticks out in my head. Uh, Hansa Teutonica is a brilliant game. Uh, I think that Firenze is also brilliant. I think Stauffer Dynasty is great. Uh, I like uh, many of his other designs. Gugong is also a really good one. Um, so some really good stuff has been made by Andreas Stedding. Um, and I would say Uwe Rosenberg is my favorite designer, but he has designed some of my favorite games. Uh, you know, in particular, A Feast for Odin is incredible. <laughs> so, you know, obviously that one's going to be really high up there. But in general, I don't have like a designer that I put on a really high pedestal. Uh, but yeah, th there are many designers that, that pique my interest more than others. Joe asks, when doing the playthroughs for games with hidden information, is it hard to pretend not knowing all the information? Yes and no. Uh, th that's an interesting question, and that's definitely come up in the past. Uh, there have been a couple of games that I have declined to cover because they have so much hidden information that I'm not really sure how to do it well. In general, those are more games where you have to like negotiate back and forth about hidden information and maybe there's like hidden identities and that kind of thing. Uh, but 
there are lots of games that I play where, you know, the hand is supposed to be hidden. You're not supposed to know what's in there. And fortunately, um, <laughs> it's really easy to forget <laughs> what those different players have. You know, I found myself over time when I make the, when I film these things, I tend to compartmentalize rather well. And when, I, when I'm on the red player's turn, I'm sitting there and I am uh, looking at um, the options that red can do. And maybe it's a, you know, a thing in the back of my mind that the blue player is probably going to be doing this on the next turn. But oftentimes I'll finish the red player's turn, go to the blue player's turn and be like, oh, that's right. They have this card. Oh, that's good. Uh, so I guess I kind of lean on the fact that if I don't think about it too much, it's not actually that hard. Um, and then I guess I just mix in with that, trying to show variety, trying to initiate interesting circumstances. Like I really try to play well in these videos and also show interesting uh, circumstances. Sometimes I intentionally play a little bit poorly to push the game into a game state so that I can teach something new. And sometimes uh, when there's hidden information, I can usually do that a little bit easier because, oh, we didn't know that they had that card or something like that. Um, I know there was one that was particularly hard recently. It was called Veiled Fate, uh, where every player had a hidden person they cared about uh, trying to, you know, uh, get uh, points on the board. And that one was a little bit tricky, trying to play well while not being obvious who that character was was vying for while also knowing full well what uh, character every single person was vying for. So I guess, yeah, again, the, the short answer is um, it's easier than you'd think, but it is still not that easy. <laughs> Justin asks, how do you set up your overhead camera for recording playthroughs? Is it a rig or on a ledge? How do you prevent equipment from falling over? Those are great questions, and I could try to move my camera right now to show you because it's literally right off camera, but the best thing that you can do is uh, search for, um, on Google or whatnot, just John Gets Games, let's make a playthrough. Uh, I made a behind the scenes video where I go through the entire process of how I make my playthrough videos. And at one point I talk all about my my rig, um, how I hold the camera, how the microphones work and everything. And there's timestamps down below. Uh, so you can go right to that point and not watch me editing or something like that. So uh, that's the best, the best thing to do is uh, check out the video and it will probably uh, answer all the questions that you have. Uh, all right, let's see here. Oh, and the short answer for preventing the equipment falling over, I have a really big weight. Actually, I can show you that. Oh, no, it's tied down. There's a 15-pound weight over there <laughs> stopping everything from falling over. Uh, all right, all right, let's see here. Jonathan asks, which game do you think best utilizes the Yahtzee mechanic? Um, so I guess the Yahtzee mechanic being you roll dice, and then you save some, and then you roll, then you save some, and then you roll again, and then you do, do stuff with it. Um, I think the one that really jumps out to me the most is going to be Gonshun Clever. Um, I think that, um, oh, what was that other one? Uh, Manmus, uh, oh, what's, oh, it's called um, Divi Dice in English. That's right. Uh, that one also does a really great job uh, with the Yatsu mechanic. I like it in both of those cases. I think after playing uh, Divi Dice many times, I do slightly prefer Gonshun Clever. Um, that one, um, you are rolling dice, and then when you, uh, let's see here. Actually, in that one, I guess you roll dice and you save and then you roll and you save. So yeah, I think Divi Dice actually, specifically from a Yahtzee perspective, is the better game when it comes to the Yahtzee mechanic. And, and the reason for that is because in that game, you can roll up to three times and every time you roll, you can save dice. But the trick is every time you re-roll, all of your opponents can use one of the dice that you just re-rolled. So that means if you roll once and you stop, then your opponents get nothing. If you roll, if you re-roll uh, one time, then you get, you know, a re-roll, so, the, so those might be better numbers, but now all of your opponents can copy a die you just re-rolled, and if you re-roll again, all of your opponents can copy again. So I think that's a really cool twist on the Yahtzee mechanic because it's a big incentive to not roll more, to be like, okay, this is good enough because I don't want to keep giving free goodies to all of my opponents. It's a really good game overall. Like I said, I think as far as dice games are concerned, I slightly prefer Gonshin Clever, but uh, Divi Dice is, is excellent. Uh, Shorty Dancer asks, what are your other hobbies apart from board games or YouTube? Uh, well, YouTube is definitely not a hobby these days. This is a full-time job. Uh, but board games, I've been able to keep those largely as a hobby, which is great. Uh, as far as other hobbies are concerned, I don't have a lot of them. I keep saying I'm going to get back into reading, but I keep not doing it. I have a Kindle and I keep reading the first few pages of many books, but nothing's really grabbing me the last few months. I will say that I've been enjoying making mods and tabletop simulator. That's felt like kind of a side hobby. Um, honestly, one new hobby that I've been really enjoying is house renovation. Uh, Jessica and I, about two or three weeks ago, started uh, really seriously working on projects that we've been meaning to work on in this house for three years. We moved in here three years ago, and I've been really getting a lot of satisfaction out of 
doing these things that we've been talking about doing for three years. We spent most of Thanksgiving week um, doing renovation, you know, uh, repainting walls in about 40% of our house, uh, painting ceilings, ripping out light fixtures, installing new light fixtures, doing a bunch of new electrical work uh, for like replacing wall outlets and all that kind of stuff. And um, man, that's really satisfying. And it feels kind of like a hobby um, and kind of like picking out uh, some of these projects, you know, 20 minutes a night or an hour here or there. And then on the weekend, working on a big project for like five hours. So I guess that's kind of turning into a hobby considering we have a lot more that we're hoping to do. So that's going to be, I guess, a short to medium run hobby uh, for us. And I've been surprised at how much enjoyment and satisfaction I've been getting uh, from doing it. Uh, also, I'm like, you know, doing productive stuff with my favorite person in the world. So that, that definitely helps. All right. Omar says, would you ever do an updated top 20 of all time? Um, maybe it's possible. Uh, sometimes I feel like I regret having made that top 20 list, uh, so many years ago. What was that? Like four years ago, three or four years ago, because so many of those games on the list would not actually be on the list anymore. Many of those games, uh, I don't even own anymore. Uh, I remember on that list, uh, through the ages, uh, a new story was my number one. And I remember saying like, I have a hard time ever seeing this one not be my favorite game. Uh, and it definitely is far from my favorite game these days. Like my tastes changed and there's so many other good games that I've played since then. So maybe, uh, I've been mulling around, maybe trying to do a little bit more top 10 type lists. It seems like people really do enjoy them. Um, they're not my favorite kind of content to make and they're far from my favorite kind of content to, uh, actually watch, but I don't know. I have a lot of stories, I have a lot of things to say about games when I make these top 10 lists, and it seems like they get a lot of traction. So um, it's something that I'm considering. Uh, it, it's possible. Uh, so Stephen asks, what is your favorite game with incentivization and why is it Century Spice Road? <laughs> well, uh, my favorite game with incentivization is easily Firenze. And I gotta be honest, I actually actively dislike Century Spice Road. I wanted to love it because it has that cent uh, that um, incentive mechanic, but I have a big fundamental problem with Century Spice Road. It's a personal nitpick of mine, but it's that you have this incentive mechanic where, you know, every time you take a card, you have to put a resource down, or maybe it's just a coin. It's been a while. You put something down onto every card that you passed over. The problem is nothing else cycles that road and that row of cards. And in Century Spice Road, you have a um, engine card row, like cards that do stuff, and you have a victory point card row, and at a certain point, every time I played Century Spice Road, um, people would be happy enough with the cards that they built in their engine, or at least enough people will be happy enough, that they then just play the cards they have, and take the scoring cards, and they stop taking any cards from the, the sliding row, so what that means is somebody who isn't that happy with their engine now might not be able to actually buy the really good stuff they want, because that card row has just stuck. It's like set like cement, and it will Will likely never move for the rest of the game, at least from my perspective and the games that I've seen. So it almost seemed like when the action card row seized up, you know, became dry like cement, the person who happened to have the best engine in their hand would then win, but you have to play through another one third of the game or so to see who actually ends up being that person. So that really frustrated me. Uh, the reason I think Firenze is an amazing incentivization game is because it's the entire game. There aren't two rows, there is just one row, and every single turn you must take a card. Uh, every card you jump over, you have to put a resource down onto as normal. And I love the fact that in Firenze, there are cards that are just objectively awful. You don't want to take them. They hurt it's like a warehouse fire or something like that. But as people continue to not take that card, you put more and more resources on it to the point where through the magic of incentivization, somebody actually wants to take that card. The penalty of the card is far outweighed by this pile of resources that have been put on top of it by people who don't want to actually suffer that penalty. And I think that's just exceptional. Uh, the rest of the game for Enze is good as well, but it's such an amazing pure distillation of the incentivization mechanic. I certainly wanted to love Century Spice Road, but uh, after many plays uh, trying to find a fun game in there, I just, I kind of gave up, unfortunately. All right. Shorty says, also, I loved your last video about the best games before 2010. Yeah, that one got a lot of traction. I was not uh, expecting that. I definitely have some regrets about how that one went. Um, there's some games that I feel like should have probably been on there. Uh, Fresco, I totally forgot, was a 2010 release. Uh, Brass, I totally forgot, came out before 2010, so that should have been on there. Haunted Teutonica, I decided not to put on there, and in retrospect, I really regret it. Haunted Teutonica is so good. It definitely deserved to be on that list. Um, so, you know, realistically, maybe it's just, instead of, like, my top 10 older games, it's, like, 10 older games that I really like. Uh, but it seems like people like ranking, and they like 
having things be sorted. So um, yeah, I, I, part of me feels like in the future, maybe I'll do unsorted lists. Like here are 10 games I like from this specific criteria, but <clears throat> at the same time, people like things being organized. And I think that gets a little bit more attraction and um, you know, more comments and more discussion and all that kind of stuff, which is certainly a good thing. So that's something I'm trying to keep in mind. Uh, David asks, how do you feel your preferred game weight has changed over the, your time in the hobby? Well, it's interesting. My, my preferred weight has shifted a little bit. Um, early on, uh, I didn't have a preferred weight. Like the first year or two, I played anything. Like someone's like, I bought this new game. I played it. I didn't care what it was. I might play Descent one night, which is like a dungeon delving game. And the next night I play like Age of Steam. And the next night I'd play some light card game, you know, a bunch or something like that. So I was all over the place. And then shifting into like the 20... 12, 13 uh, kind of era, I got into longer games. Like I definitely found myself gravitating more towards heavier style games. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been gliding now more towards like 60 to 90 minute euros. And honestly, I'm starting to notice uh, over the last few months that my my personal taste is starting to glide back up a little bit. I, I'm becoming a little less interested in the more simplistic, elegant euros and finding more fun in uh, the uh, increased complexity and slightly longer play, uh, play time of games. So it definitely shifts over time. Uh, I'm not sure how far up it'll go. Probably not very much. I think it's just a little subtle correction. I think I went from liking really heavy stuff to really focusing on the elegant light stuff like Carcassones and stuff. And now I'm kind of popping back probably to a nice uh, medium point in the middle. Uh, Bill asks, do you think you will continue with Jongus Games full-time after COVID is over, or will you seek different or supplemental opportunities? The short answer to that is, um, yeah, I'm probably doing this for at least the short to medium run. Um, my old job will hopefully come back. I really hope it does, because I just, it was an amazing company, uh, run and owned by amazing people. I really hope they're able to survive this, uh, with no events happening, but, you know, by the time that comes around, I will have been working for myself full time for well over a year. And I don't really see myself ratcheting back on that. I'm, I'm figuring out how to do this well. I'm figuring out how to, you know, make this kind of the new phase of my career. And once COVID subsides, I mean, it's possible. Uh, I'm trying to take everything. I'm trying not to make big commitments. Um, like four months ago, I was seriously considering quitting entirely, like literally walking away from Jongus Games entirely and trying to find a, a corporate tech job making you know, Bay Area, six-figure uh, income and that kind of thing. Um, I took uh, a class and I, I learned a lot about that kind of stuff. And I realized that actually I want to keep giving this a shot because I do love board games. And so the idea of being in the board game industry is it's, it's very alluring. So uh, for now, I am not committing to anything, but I am hoping slash planning on continuing to do John Gets Games full time, even in a post-COVID world. And um you know, so far I've been able to make this work uh, financially and emotionally and mentally uh, in a COVID world. So hopefully that will still be the case in a post-COVID world. I can only see it being easier <laughs> then than now, but uh, who knows? I don't want to predict the future too much. Actually, my wife just uh, mentioned to me that in a post-COVID world, one big impact is going to be that um, she's not here every day. You know, she works full-time from home in the COVID world and that will be a strange uh, change uh, when she goes back to probably working from home like two days a week and then working away from the house three days a week. Um, it'll probably feel a little bit lonelier. So that actually could be a, a one detraction uh, in a post-COVID world. But I'm just going to have to see uh, when that happens, hopefully as soon as possible. Uh, Justin asks, in a future where board games could come up with no assembly required, would you prefer four hours of punching or would you embrace a punchless future? Um, Yeah, I do enjoy punching. I, I do enjoy getting a new game and like opening up all the cards and sorting all the cards and counting all the components and punching all the bits and organizing them into bags. Um, I mean, if I didn't have to do that, I don't think I would be mad or upset, but I would certainly rather spend a little bit less money to have a game that I would punch out versus a game that have everything uh, be punchless. I'm not sure. Is, is that the future that we're going towards in this industry? Uh, I didn't know that was actually happening, but uh, I, I hope that doesn't become the norm, especially if it costs more money. Uh, Kenix asks, what was the first and last game that you bought? Huh. Yeah, okay, this one I can do. Uh, the first game that I bought, what would that have been? Dominion. I think it was Dominion uh, because I was gifted Stone Age. I had Stone Age before Dominion. Uh, Catan kind of brought me into the hobby, but I played someone else's copy. Um, then I learned about Stone Age. I put it on a Christmas list. I got it for Christmas. Loved Stone Age. Played that one like 20 plus times in my group. Because back then, 
we just had a game and we just played only that game. We didn't really know about worlds where people had entire bookshelves full of games. Um, and then I went to a board game night. This is a, a real abstraction of like a couple years of time, but I went to a board game night and I played Dominion and it blew my mind. This was in 2009. It had just come out. I was just starting to fall into the uh, deep hole of the hobby. And I remember I was at a board game store. I played Dominion and I got up, I walked downstairs and I bought it. It was there because I was at a board game store and I walked right back upstairs. Uh, I, it blew me away that much, just like everyone. I mean, Dominion was a big deal. Uh, as far as the last game that I purchased, yeah, it's got to be NO1800. Uh, I purchased that one about a month ago, uh, just after I bought Howler Tau. I bought those right around the same time. Still don't have my copy of Howler Tau. It's been over four weeks that it's been in the mail, which is a little frustrating, or I guess almost four weeks. But um, yeah, I guess that's the most recent one. Actually, no, I take it back. Eclipse. I bought Eclipse after I did NO1800. So there you go. Eclipse Second Dawn is the most recent game that I purchased. Joe says, uh, top 10 lists get views. The board game barrage guys say they get much more reviews. Yeah, they do. I mean, I put out my top 10 older uh, games video and uh, YouTube analytics was like, this video is getting twice as much traction as your normal one. It's like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> and considering I put a lot less effort. I, I still put several, like probably four to five hours into that, uh, that uh, video overall through the editing and whatnot. But it's true. I mean, lists do well on YouTube uh, in all genres, but definitely in the board gaming sphere. Um, I don't necessarily want to like chase that, like, oh, I got to, you know, get more views. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, change everything to get more views. Like I've always had my, uh, you know, guiding compass or whatever be doing content that I really believed in, that I really wanted to put out there. And top 10 lists in general have been kind of to the side of that. But I'm also not particularly against maybe doing a little bit more of those because, you know, a big part of this is making content that people like to watch. And people definitely like to watch top 10 lists. Uh, Eric asks, do you think the pandemic will have any lasting impacts on the industry? How about your personal life? Um, as far as the industry is concerned, it would not surprise me if the amount of on-game board game develop, uh, sorry, online board game development that is happening is going to stick. I think a lot more board games are going to be developed on Tabletop Simulator, on Tabletopia, instead of on paper. And I think um, that that's probably, maybe not going to revolutionize the board game development scene, but you know, in order to develop board games, people have been forced to do this online and it makes iterating so much faster and you can easily network up and play test with people from all over the world, not just your tiny insular echo chamber of a play test group. So I think slash hope that the pandemic is actually going to have a positive impact on board game development, uh, allowing board games to be developed quicker and faster uh, through better iterations and maybe make better games because uh, you can get a wider variety of people actually testing through these games to, you know, try to find issues and try to work all that stuff out. As far as me personally, yes, I mean, massive changes. You know, it, it forced me to go full time with John Gets Games uh, years before I was planning on doing that. So that has been a, a very large impact on my life uh, for better and for worse, largely for the better, for the most part for the better, but I've definitely had some growing pains over the last year. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going back from it. I, I think, you know, 2020 has permanently changed my life um, and that's fine. You know, I've been wanting to get full time in the industry for a very long time into the board game industry. I just was slowly working my way in, going part time for, with my other job and part time with John Gets Games. Um, I guess maybe I just needed to be, you know, kicked off the diving board into the pool. <laughs> I, I imagine at some point I would have uh, committed to it, but, you know, didn't have to make that decision. It just happened for me. Stuart asks, uh, with Halorto, Anno 1800, uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak, Fayum, Merv, Bonfire, and Red Cathedral, is this the best Essence season ever and Cloud Age to come? I do think that this is a strong year. Uh, I know, you know, in many years, uh, maybe not every year, but I oftentimes hear like around this time of the year, people lamenting on, uh, you know, Twitter and whatnot, like, oh, this is a really weak year. You know, why couldn't every year be like, you know, I think 2016 was a really strong year. Um, but I think 2020 is going to be a strong year. Um, I agree. Uh, Howler Tau and Anno are very good games. Anno in particular is so good. Um, and uh, Arnak, I've still only played it once. I'd like to play it more, but it's a really good game. Uh, I haven't played Merv Bonfire uh, yet, either of those, but they do look good. Uh, I tried Red Cathedral and it was fine. I actually recorded an impressions vlog of it already. Um, it didn't necessarily blow me away, but it's a fine game. And I have to say, I played Fayum last night, a four player game, and I'm not going to do an impressions vlog segment on it right now because I'll save that for later. I have a lot of thoughts, but it did not go over very well. It was a really long game. And at the end, I had a couple of my friends saying they hated it and they knew they hated it like 
halfway through. Uh, so FAM did not go over super well. I, I have some quite positive things to say about the game and also some very negative things to say about the game. Overall, my impression is pretty negative, although some people seem to really like it, but you know, that's board games. <laughs> some people like it, some people don't. Uh, for us, that game did not have a very good first impression. But uh, to answer your question, I do hope that this is going to go down as a really strong year. Um, I'm sure there was some good stuff that came out earlier on in the year, but my memory is fickle and nothing's popping out. But in general, I feel like I've played a lot of uh, really fun games this year, and uh, a couple of them feel like they could have lasting power. Certainly, and I know I keep harping on it, but Anno 1800 seems like it's the kind of game that uh, is going to be talked about for a long time. Certainly by me, because I can't shut up about it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Fire Lover asks, uh, earlier you talked about Spice Road, uh, Century Spice Road. What are your thoughts on the other two in the trilogy? Uh, so the next one was Eastern Wonders, and I played that one a couple of times. And did I make a video about that? I'm pretty sure I made a full playthrough of that one. Um, I like that one a lot more than Century Spice Road, but obviously I have some pretty uh, strong opinions about Century Spice Road, some pretty strong negative opinions. Um, it's an interesting thing about Spice Road. Like, I wanted to love it. It's one of those uh, games where, like, in my mind, it's like you tried to jump, you know, Evil Knievel jumping over the Grand Canyon, uh, but you just barely missed. And it's a it's really bad if you just barely miss jumping over the Grand Canyon. If you make it, that's amazing. And I feel like Century Spice Road is one of those games that was almost a game that I love, but instead it's a game that I actually kind of really dislike. I don't really fall into the middle. Um, I felt like uh, Eastern Wonders, which was the second one, was fine. Uh, the pick up and deliver aspects were pretty good. It didn't really stick with us. It, there was a lot of AP, uh, at least for us in the game. Um, it was enjoyable overall, but um, again, it didn't really... Uh, keep coming back. Uh, and then when it comes to the last one, oh my gosh, I've forgotten the name of it. Uh, <laughs> I'll put it on screen when I edit this later on. Uh, I made a video for this one, I think. Uh, but I definitely played the, the third one, which was more uh, worker placement, um, Euro, light Euro style. And that game was fine. It, it really didn't do anything that uh, made me... Uh, particularly interested. So I guess my favorite of the three is the second one, uh, Eastern Wonders, but even that one is not something that I kept around. Like I don't have any of them on my, in my collection anymore. Shrey says, I just caught up. Carnegie is great. You should definitely get that played soon. And Stuff for Dynasty is my favorite setting game and should get more attention. Yes. Uh, good to hear about Carnegie. Uh, again, I, I read like the first, I read like the setup and then we went to go do something else. So I do want to come back and fully read that and give that one a play online. It looks really cool. Uh, and yeah, Stuff for Dynasty, I have, so I really like this game, but I don't think I necessarily love it. Uh, it was, I think, my second full playthrough that I did on this channel, and I love the main aspects to this game where you are spending resources as little people up into the clouds, and you're kind of sending them into the future, and you're picking them back up again. I'm not going to talk about all the specifics there, but I can't help but feel like the end game scoring cards kind of sour the game for me a little bit. It takes me from loving the game, like I love everything about the game, until I get to those end game scoring cards, which feel a little bit swingy and put in some game states that I don't necessarily love. So unfortunately, it, it kind of shoots up to like a 9 out of 10, and then settles back down to like maybe a 7 out of 10 for me. I still really like Stoffer Dynasty, and I still own it. I don't see getting rid of it because um, there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. And speaking of which, a bunch of incentivization in that game. I think Andrea Stedding likes doing incentivization, uh, you know, with uh, uh, Forenze as well. It's probably part of the reason I like uh, their designs so much. Uh, you know, in Stafford Dynasty, like everything you don't take just gets more treasure chests and eventually things will get taken. That's It's a really cool game. I definitely, uh, ha I still have strong uh, feelings about it. Even though I said it's not quite the game I wish it was, um, I still heartily recommend it and look forward to playing it more in the future. Uh, Kenix asks, for your full playthrough, do you know the percentage where you win? Uh, as in the player that, you know, we collectively control. I always root for the perspective you are playing and get sad every time you lose. Um, I don't track it. Uh, I, I think it, it, it tended to go in waves it almost seemed like like sometimes like we would win several games in a row and then we would lose several games in a row um you know i would try not to favor us as a player when i did th those playthroughs um you know sometimes there were miraculous moments that kind of brought things back up but didn't quite bring it up enough uh and i really like that people were rooting for it um that's probably the biggest thing that i miss uh from not doing the extended playthroughs anymore is that feeling of presenting a complete playthrough, you know, a complete story, like, you know, it has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has a, you know, an end that might have a uh, tragedy, or it might have, you know, a triumph or whatnot. I, I think that's the biggest loss for the channel, and I wish that it didn't have to be that way, but unfortunately, 
those extended playthroughs just took way too much time and they they took way too much of my mental um, happiness <laughs> away from the process of actually making these videos. So I regret the fact that I can't make those anymore uh, for the most part. I've made a couple recently, but I can't make them consistently. Um, but, you know, it's still the right thing to do. Hey, before you play is here, uh, welcome, Monique. I'm assuming Nav Monique slash Naveen slash both of you. <laughs> uh, they just popped in to say you rock. You rock. <laughs> I actually, uh, if you haven't heard of Before You Play, uh, they make full playthroughs. This is a great segue. Uh, I watch pretty much every one of their full playthroughs. Um, I used to watch every one of mine because obviously I was editing them. So now I can just like enjoy well-edited, well-played full playthroughs uh, on the Before You Play uh, YouTube channel. There are other uh, really good YouTube channels as well, like Slicker Drips that does full playthroughs as well. Um, but yeah, I've been really impressed with the Before You Play stuff. It's, it's really well done. Uh, all right. Uh, Stuart says, wow, I think fam is amazing. So clever. Interesting to hear your thoughts on the full views. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to go into it uh, uh, in extended form here. I'll definitely talk about it later on. I read a bunch of forum threads on BGG after our play to see if anyone else felt the same way we did. And all of the forum threads on BGG are glowing. But when I went to the comments, there were a couple of comments that seemed to have very similar experiences to us. Long story short, like the 22nd version of FAM. Um, it took three hours for the four of us, which felt like way longer than we were expecting. It seemed like we built up a hand of cards with kind of an engine, and then we just kind of did the same thing over and over again. The placement of things on the map seemed arbitrary. The theme seemed so tenuous, not that I really care about theme. So while I love the card row uh, mechanics and I love the idea of collectively building out a civilization uh, competitively, it just was a bit of a thought for us. But I'll talk about that for probably like 15 to 20 minutes on an impressions vlog that I'll uh, probably record later on this week uh, or maybe next week. Anyway, Jake says, I appreciate your appreciation for Tabletop Simulator. I really wish more creators slash publishers talked about how great a resource it is for selling physical copies of games. I would love to see some actual data, if it's possible to even come up with, for if how many people are buying games after playing them on Tabletop Simulator? Um, Tabletop Simulator is a bit of a murky place, ethically, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, people can make mods with their games and put it out there, and other people can play them without ever having owned it. For instance, we played Fam last night, uh, for, uh, the four of us, and none of us owned it, but somebody else had made a mod and put it on Tabletop Simulator. So were we stealing the game? Well, if I'd gone to BGGCon this year, I guarantee I would have played FAM. It would have been in the uh, hot games room, I'm sure, and we would have made that happen because I was quite intrigued to try it. So part of me feels like, well, it's it's functionally a pretty similar situation, but uh, just like Board Game GeekCon, I'm trying to also buy games that I really like that I play in these settings. So when I come home from Board Game GeekCon, I usually buy two to three of the best games that I played at that convention, although I usually play like 30 games at Board Game GeekCon. And for Tabletop Simulator, I'm trying to do the same thing. Uh, you know, I purchased Anno after playing it once. I pl purchased Mandala, Airland, and Sea. Um, I purchased a couple other games that I can't... Um, what? Little Town is another one. Um, so when a game really, you know, reaches out and says, hey, you're great, and, and I, I tried to to give them money because, you know, I got to try it online. And I think I also want to support the online-ness of this happening. I think, you know, the idea of having Tabletop Simulator slash Tabletopia versions of games out there for Kickstarters so that people can play it while the Kickstarter campaign is happening, or at least play with all the pieces and kind of like pretend like they're playing. I think it's such an amazing resource. And I hope that that is where the industry is going. Uh, Ogre Crusher says, uh, playing from the perspective of a player really sets your videos apart. Thank you. I, I definitely try that. Um, I've been watching uh, Twitch screen streams of video games for a very long time, Let's Plays and that kind of thing. And I, I actively modeled my uh, playthrough style off of um, how a lot of uh, Twitch streamers play their video games. In particular, I watch a lot of Hearthstone. And uh, in particular, they use the word we instead of I. You know, they say, what should we do here? Well, I think we should do this. Uh, remember last game when we did that? Um, I, I very intentionally integrated that wording into my videos because I want people to feel like they're the ones playing it. And I'm just a proxy set of hands and a proxy brain that's teaching while the game is actually being played. Um, and I like to think that uh, that ends up working out for a lot of people. And it seems like it worked out for you, Ogre Crusher. Uh, uh, David says, Stonemeyer sent out a survey uh, some survey results today uh, said that around 35% of respondents said they purchased physical games after playing digital copies. That's cool. 
uh, that's really a really high number. Uh, that's very cool to see. I'll probably uh, try to look that uh, survey up and see the details of that one later on. Uh, and yeah, I think that's going to bring us to the end. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who has been uh, uh, coming here uh, this month. I'll be doing this once again in January, probably the second week or so. I'm not sure the actual date. Uh, feel free to look out for the update vlog that'll come out in the first uh, week or so. And in that vlog, I'll mention the date for the next live Q&A. Uh, so yeah, thanks again to everybody for coming by and I'll see you on the next one. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.